Hey guys, in this video I'm going to be talking about an evidence-based approach to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. In Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, we are scientists. We are constantly observing and questioning the techniques that we have in front of us, that we learn from our instructor, that we see on YouTube, that we see in competition, and we attempt to replicate it. We want to study these things because we see it working in front of our eyes. What I want to talk about in this video is what is our goal? What is the evidence that we should be looking for? And I'm going to relate it to leg locks within Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I hope you guys enjoy this video on evidence-based Jiu-Jitsu practice. So in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, we are always looking for empirical evidence. And by empirical evidence, I mean information that is received through observation or documentation through experimentation. And so in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, we're constantly observing techniques working in front of ourselves while we're watching training partners rolling with each other at the gym, or we're experiencing it firsthand, whether it's us being successful with a sweep we just pulled off, or you yourself getting hit with a certain submission or sweep. The problem is in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is that there are a lot of false positives. A false positive is when you receive a positive result on a test when you should have received a negative. So in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, something worked when it really shouldn't have. And so false positives create a lot of problems within Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because then we start to build a false confidence in a technique when it realistically isn't something that's gonna work at the highest level. And so that is ultimately our goal within Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We want to be able to beat the best. Within Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, we wanna be able to beat the world's best black belts. If the technique is not gonna be working at that level, then why are we working on it? Whether you're training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu recreationally as a hobby, whether you're young or old, female or male, if you're looking for sport, then obviously this is extremely important for you. Even if you're looking for self-defense, you wanna be able to be ready for the best fighters that you're gonna come across. I'm not looking to train to beat white belts and neither should you. We wanna be training techniques that are fundamentally sound and are gonna work at that level. That's gonna make us progress faster at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You're not gonna be wasting your time learning techniques that are acceptable for white belts and then you're gonna to have to get rid of them once you become a blue belt or a purple belt or even higher up. And so false positives in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, especially in the gym, come from one, maybe the person that you're going against isn't that good. So this can just be from lower belts. Like if I'm hitting some sweet move that I saw on YouTube on a white belt for the first time, that doesn't mean that that is a good technique. It worked in that situation because the white belt for one didn't know what jujitsu is as a whole and you could basically do whatever you wanted to them. They don't know how to defend that specific submission. Maybe the breaking mechanics of whatever submission you're playing with isn't actually that strong and you have people that are tapping early or you have them tapping because they have a certain lack of flexibility in a joint. Even if we start having submissions working on the higher belts at our gym, how good are those belts at that level. And that's the great thing about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We have a battleground in which we can experiment and observe what works at the highest level. So what do I mean by the highest level? We have 80 CC championships where the guys have to go through qualifiers to get there. This is without a doubt the highest level that we get to observe Jiu-Jitsu at. It is no gi, so gi techniques aren't applying here, but we get to see a rule set that allows reaping and heel hooks. So we get to see how guard passing is affected by leg locks. We get to see the leg locks and how they work at the highest level and anything else in between there. If it's working, if you're seeing it getting hit at ADCC and consistently, then there is value in that evidence and we should be looking to replicate that. At the other levels, we are looking at Noki Worlds. We are looking at PANS, the European Championship, Super Fights, whenever we're looking at fight to win or metamorphosis, if, if we're seeing black belts at the highest level going against each other, then whatever's working in there, it's gonna be evidence that we can take and try and study. So our goal with joint locks is to be able to cause catastrophic damage to a joint so that even if somebody was on drugs or just pumped with adrenaline, we're able to break that joint to the point where they can no longer continue to fight. The problem with leg locks in the gym is that people are going to tap early, they're gonna tap often because they wanna keep themselves safe. And even when you have people that are fighting against it, we aren't taking the submissions to the very end. Or you better be extremely careful with how far you're going with that because if you're hurting your training partners, you're not gonna have any other training partners to work with. When we're looking at joint locks, we want to either see the submission 
consistently applied at the highest level that's leading to tapping. Or we also, hopefully, for scientific purposes, I never wish injury on anybody, but if we can witness breaks at the highest level, then we know that the technique is sound. Are people having to tap to it? And if they don't tap, can we catastrophically destroy that joint? So the first submission on the list is heel hooks. Even at the lower stage of heel hooks where we didn't have control and people were just cranking the hell out of them, we can look at them and see that heel hooks are getting hit consistently and we can see that if people do not tap to them, they are getting significantly hurt from that. I don't even really have to show much for video on these because everyone understands the danger of heel hooks. So the reason why it's become so much more popular is that there's a lot more control and a hierarchy of positions as we move through the Ashy Grammy positions upwards to the inside Senkaku slash 411 position. Heel hooks work. And when you look at the stats for competitions like ADCC, you're gonna see heel hooks showing up all the time. The next submission that we look at for effectiveness is the knee bar. The knee bar, we actually don't get to see a lot of absolute damage where people can no longer walk off the mats, but we know how far the leg is supposed to extend and we can tell when that knee bar has been hyperextended. So when we look at Leandro Lowe in a deep knee bar, or we look at AJ Agazarm in a deep knee bar against Gary Tonnen, we can recognize that that is not how the knee is supposed to go and that damage can start occurring here. But because of how the joint's designed and because of everything reinforcing it and it's quite a robust joint, someone like Leandro Lowe can, can even go past its normal range of motion and still be able to limp around on that. However, what makes up for that knee bar is the fact that we see a lot of people at the black belt level tapping to it. We see it within the higher level nogi grappling matches and we also see it especially in the gi matches because it will be the most effective leg lock that we can do once we are at the brown belt to black belt level. Next on the list, we're looking at toe holds. We're starting to get into the realm where we got the, the big dogs, the heel hook and the knee bar, and then the toe hold, we're not seeing as often at the highest level. However, we are still seeing that submission being hit and we are able to see catastrophic damage. When we look at Humble Bahal's match, we see his ankle completely destroyed, dislocated, whatever ended up actually happening to it. He didn't want to tap to it, and his opponent was able to put him away so that he could no longer fight on it. The joint, the limb, was no longer useful at that point, and the ref had to stop the match. Then we have the ankle slash Achilles lock. This is my favorite submission. I love doing it because it's one of the safer submissions that I'm able to do in the gym, and I can apply it at white belt to black belt, and I can apply it with a lot more aggression because it's not gonna cause damage to the knee like a knee bar, a toe hold, or a heel hook could. But I also have to recognize that this technique isn't consistently hit at the highest level. Now, to my surprise, even as I was preparing for this video, the ankle lock is actually starting to show up a little bit more in competition than I would have thought. The Delahiva ankle lock that Kyle Terra has made famous is starting to show a little more prominence within the sport. We have Kyle Terra hitting it, we have Mikey Musumeci hitting it, we have Craig Jones hitting it against Richie Martinez. So now that's a submission that we're starting to see people working on more because we're starting to see it show up at the highest level. Mikey Musumeci has been hitting other kinds of belly down variations of the ankle lock and we even have Buchecha hitting a belly down ankle lock. Now, the things that we got to be considering about that, yes, it looks like there has been damage caused that makes the person unable to stand up immediately afterwards, but there's only been a handful of instances that we can recall at the highest level of black belt where people are actually having to tap to this. Then we come to the bottom of the list, calf slicers. Calf slicers are in my opinion, not effective and not something that should be spent time on. A lot of us are just hobbyists. We have full-time jobs, we have families. We don't have time to learn all this stuff. And so the purpose of this is to train the best techniques that we're maximizing our training time and becoming as effective as quickly as we can be. Calf slicers, if we look at the highest level, are almost non-existent. We see like the only time that I could actually find calf slicers being applied was at EBI, you know, but the guy shuts it down. We have Hoffa Mendez getting into a pretty deep calf slicer against Cabrinha at an ADCC and Cabrinha was able to eat it and then he was able to get out of it. We do have Felipe Pena hitting a, ver a different version of a calf slicer in one of his super fights against the black belt. 
One, the calf slicer is actually done a bit more conceptually sound in my opinion because it ends up externally rotating the hip quite a bit. That's further putting your opponent out of alignment and it's gonna be putting pressure in different ways on the leg. However, Felipe Pena, I'm pretty sure, could bear hug me and cut me in half with just a squeeze. So just because someone like Felipe Pena was able to hit that technique is not something that we want to, it's not enough for me to look at that and go, yes, this is statistically significant. This is not an outlier and I wanna practice this. The problem with calf slicers is that typically people tap to it because of pain. Pain does not mean harm. It is uncomfortable to have someone's shin jam in the back of your knee and having it crushed but how much damage is it actually causing? We wanna be causing catastrophic damage to the joint. I don't care if your knee got destroyed by a calf slicer at your own gym, because I'm not training to beat you. Would you, could you ever imagine someone like Gordon Ryan or Kyle Terra or Half Mendez tapping to a calf slicer? There isn't significant evidence to show that calf slicers are going to effectively destroy joints at the highest level. I wanna be able to, I wanna, I'm training to beat the best. That means guys that are flexible, guys that are strong, guys that are willing to risk getting hurt. I wanna be able to put them away. If I was able to say, theoretically, put somebody like Gordon Ryan deep in an inside heel hook, do I have confidence that this could potentially hurt him? And so in regards to leg locks, I wanna focus everything around heel hooks and knee bars personally. I wanna work on all the different ashy Grammy positions, working on how I can move through the hierarchy of standard ashy to outside ashy to a rear or cross ashy, working through to the 411 position, which is ultimately the best leg lock position, and then getting my inside heel hook finishes, working on my outside heel hook finishes, and how can I also tie those together into knee bars and then also connect them into passing. Calf slicers just don't tie in well into this system of leg locks that has been created. And in my mind, they're not effective. And so I would rather put that time in into developing these super effective submissions so that then I'm maximizing my training potential and I'm getting better at stuff that I'm gonna be able to take with me from any level. Now, once again, as a scientist, looking at evidence, say in 2020, if people start getting wrecked by calf slicers, then I have to reevaluate the new information in front of me and we're gonna be having a very different conversation then. Every technique has a beginning in which it has to be tested and where it can eventually rise to the top and be statistically significant. But until then, if you're not the person competing, going out there and testing it, like Keenan Cornelius talks about this stuff all the time about how he's experimenting with his lapel-based attacks. He's getting to go out there as a world-class black belt and test this worm guard stuff at the highest level. And anything that he works on, he's also beginning to be, even in the gym, he's gonna be training with highly competitive black belts. So when he can start pulling this stuff off against people like Andre Galval, there starts to become some real evidence behind that. So I wanted to cover this because I think this is an important topic to maximize your potential in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And so you guys know where I'm coming from. So especially as we start working on some leg lock defenses in my next few video series, when I start crapping on techniques like say ankle locks and calf slicers, this is where I'm drawing those conclusions from. I just ask that you consciously try and focus a bit more on the, what are the techniques that you're doing within your Jiu Jitsu game or what are you teaching to your students and is it stuff that we're seeing work at the highest level? 